Suppose that a ball is dropped from the upper observation deck of the CN Tower in Toronto, 450 meters above the ground. Find the velocity of the ball after 5 seconds. And we need a little background first. Through experiments carried out 4 centuries ago, Galileo discovered that the distance fallen by any freely falling body is proportional to the square of the time it has been falling. This model for free falling neglects air resistance. If the distance fallen after t seconds is denoted by st, which is right here, st, that's our function, and measured in meters, then Galileo's law express, is expressed by this equation, x st, which is our function of 4.9 t squared, and y, this is half of acceleration due to gravity, a natural law. So this is given. If just in case you want to know where this number is coming from, gravity 9.8. The difficulty in finding the velocity after five seconds is that we are dealing with a single instant of time, t equals five. So no time interval is involved. However, we can approximate the desired quantity by computing the average velocity over the brief time interval of a tenth of a second from t equals 5 to t equals 5.1. And so this would be expressed by average velocity equals change in position divided by time elapsed. And so our time elapsed would be 0 0.1 because 5.1 minus 5 is 0.01, and it already said tenth of a second. And our given function, which is s of t, s of t, right? So that's why this is expressed this way change in position minus the change of position right here. So our given position was 5 seconds, because that's what, what the question was asking. The question is saying. I read the question again. It says, suppose that a ball is dropped from the upper observation deck of the CN Tower in Toronto, 450 meters above the ground. Find the velocity of the ball after 5 seconds. So, what's happening after 5 seconds? So, this is 5 seconds, this is after 5 seconds. And so, we plug in our function, which is, what's our function? S of t equals 4.9 t squared. So 4.9 times 5.1 squared minus 4.9 times 5 squared. And this gives us 49.49 meters squared. And I want to show you what's happening. So we have, we're up this tall building. The uh, building doesn't look like this. And we throw something off. Or it says drop. So we're not there's no force behind it, we just drop it. And it's going to go down like this. And I don't know how fast or how long it will take to hit the ground, but I know that, what do you call it? At a given time, it's going to be somewhere around here. So let's say, let's say right here, it's five seconds. And we're trying to find what's the velocity of the ball after 5 seconds, so that's why we're using this in time interval of 5.1 5.1, so right here average velocity over successfully smaller time periods so we're going to be given our time period intervals between 5 to 6 and so our average velocity between here be 53.9 because we're plugging in our number for 6 like the function we had earlier and so right here we have a time interval of 5 to 5.1 and we end up getting the number we had earlier and so we're trying to approximate the num a closest number to 5 and so this is really close to 5. 
it's going to be 49 because you could you could clearly see that it's getting closer and closer to 49 so it converges to 49 and what's happening is like what we did last time remember we have this parabola and then we have these given points we're trying to find our secret line to get closer and closer to which won't look like this it will look like like this we're trying to get closer and closer to this arbitrary point P which would be 5 which is an arbitrary B5 so the instantaneous velocity T equals 5 is defined to be the limiting value so limits this is what we're doing right now of their average velocities over shorter and shorter time periods that start at T over 5 T equals, T equals 5 Thus, it appears that the instantaneous velocity after 5 seconds is V equals 49 meters per second. You may have the feeling that the calculations used in solving this problem are very similar to those used earlier in this video. To find tangents, in fact, there is a close connection between the tangent problem and the velocity problem. If you draw the graph of the distance function of the ball, if we yeah if we draw the graph of the distance function of the ball and we consider the point p a comma 4.98 squared and q a plus h 4.9 a plus a plus h squared on the graph then the slope of the secant line pq is so this is the slope of the secant line and pq remember equals 4.9 a plus h squared minus 4.9 a squared a plus h minus a so this is looks like a bunch of numbers right now but i'll explain it right now so remember what the slope is is rise over run and so this is our given graph the mirror of the function is s equals 4.9 t squared s equals t remember our x is t So these are two points, P and Q. We denote P as A. So this is our initial point. So right here, that's A, right? Right there is A. A is our initial point. We we make A equals T. So we say let A equals T or T equals A in this point but if we want to change it back we say let A equals T and this all turns into time because this is what this is right that's our time interval and this is our acceleration so P right here that's our A then everything after our A it's H so A plus H so everything coming forward, that's H. So that's why we have this right here. A plus H minus A. So remember what's happening. We're doing the rise over the run. So A plus H minus A. So that's going to be on the bottom because these are our X's. These are our Y's. And it's Q minus P. Q minus P. That's why we have this on top. So, just want to show you that. So, what's happening is is the same as the time interval a plus a h. Remember what I said? That's our time interval. Therefore, the velocity at the time t equal t equals a. The limit of these average velocities as h approaches zero. So, as h goes to a it's approaching zero h is approaching zero must be equal to the slope of the tangent line at p the limit of the slopes of the secant line and so this is shown over here as q gets closer to p remember what i showed you earlier so don't get all confused because there are all these variables 
and as h gets closer to a we end up with the tangent line and this is just what the equation is saying is is this is a beautiful equation because it's it's simply stating how we're getting to the tangent line from our secant line so this is our secant line and we could have any number right here honestly this could have said said x it's just saying that we are getting closer and closer to p now if if this was x if this was a different given function then then these things would change right the the exponents and everything but like i was saying so you don't have to worry about how 